So, uh, like Jacopo said, I'm a co-founder of Torchbox, a web agency that uh, I started in 2000. And Django's been a really important part of our work since 2005. In fact, South was built for, uh, for a Torchbox project originally, back when Andrew Godwin was a, a very youthful and extremely enthusiastic 19-year-old, not like the uh, grumpy old man he described himself as this morning. I also run the Wagtail CMS project, which I hope some of you are familiar with. I'm going to start by describing a few projects that uh, I've built a long time ago. I'm not a brilliant programmer, but I have lots of ideas, and uh, before I had children, I used to act on some of them. This first one, from 2003, was called Mailbucket. This was at the beginning of the RSS revolution that was going to help make web contact m more semantic and shareable until Google cancelled Reader and everyone gave up on it. You emailed foo at mailbucket.org, and then you could subscribe to a, an RSS feed at uh, mailbucket.org slash foo.xml. On the back end, there was a complicated XM config that posted everything to a Python script, which populated a MySQL database. On the web front end, I had Apache forwarding to uh, a Python CGI, which concatenated strings to return the valid RSS feed. I set it up on a server with uh, 64 megabytes of memory, and I ran it for a few years until I gave up fighting the spam. By then, it had handled 2 billion emails. A year later was mtraffic.org, which passed a traffic feed from the BBC and converted it into a 500-byte web page that was designed to load quickly and predictably on the latest Nokia phones. This project was referenced in a government white paper about how the state should encourage citizens to contribute to national IT challenges. Of course, it became obsolete two years later with the launch of the iPhone, and in particular Google Maps on mobile, which I still think of as uh, one of the great technical advances of the last two decades. And then WordOff. This was another uh, one-page app. This one had a, was the first one that had an API. This came out of a conversation at work where we were, we were wondering how many trillions of developer hours had been lost to the problem of uh, copying, paste, copying text from a Word document and pasting them into a, into a, a web form. I, I don't know if this, this word is familiar to any of you. <laughs> if not, then you're lucky. I think it's, you know, it's, it's one of the big sort of uh, unsung issues of web development. Um, so WordOff was, uh, was a set of evil regular expressions that st stripped the cruft out of pasted word content. The site disappeared a few days later, a few years later, due to my incompetence around domain renewals. And I didn't really think that anyone was using it much, but uh, to my surprise, I started getting anguished emails from people whose days had started being dependent on pasting content from Word into WordOff and then into their content management systems. And finally, this one, this is caniturniton.com. This is to do with an idea that's sometimes referred to as dynamic demand. Uh, dynamic demand uses the simple trick of measuring the frequency of the national grid. If the frequency is slightly high, that shows that the grid is under excess demand. If it's low, that means that the grid has a bit of capacity. And, then, and that indicates that you should try to use electricity when, it's, when, you, when there's spare capacity. Because in order to, to handle the peaks in demand, uh, the national grid has to fire up dirty power like uh, coal stations. If we can be much more predictable about our energy use, then it means uh, it's a much better fit for renewables, which aren't quite so good at being turned on at short notice. I recently discovered that Chris Adams, who was going to be talking this afternoon but is now talking tomorrow morning, built a, a, a prototype kettle using the API from Can I Turn It On? And uh, I think it had an LED on it and it, and it, it shone green if, you, if it was a good time to make a cup of tea, and, and red if it wasn't. So there's something in common with all these screenshots, apart from my limited front-end skills. Uh, and did anybody spot it? It's to do with the URL. Uh, they're all on, uh, they're all, I had to get them all off the Wayback Machine. And uh, I think that's because Uh, at some point, the hassles of maintaining these websites outweighed the, 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 uh, the benefits, or at least the benefits that I, I perceived. And I recognize that lots of people are better than me at backups and security updates and renewing domains and certificates and so on. But I still think that running a web app is much more hassle than it should be. 
here's, uh, here's, here's how I think making a website worked, or at least how it, how it worked 10 years ago. So sometime maybe in the shower or cycling home from work or in a conversation with your friends, you have an idea. And then you, uh, then you write, you, spend, you, you stay up a couple of nights and you write some code. And this is, this is the magic bit. This is the bit where you feel like, you know, the kind of the geek in Hollywood. And then you have to get hold of a server, install the operating system, choose a web server. Then you uh, have to install Gunicorn. Then you read a blog, blog article that says that uh, uWhiskey actually gives you two more requests a second than Gunicorn, so you install uWhiskey instead. Then you set up Supervisor and, uh, to, to make sure that your apps are running the whole time. And then you worry about what's making sure that Supervisor is running all the time. And then you, you set up a firewall. Because you're a conscientious developer, you have uh, backups. You point a domain to it. Then you use Let's Encrypt to get an SSL certificate. And you monitor it. And then you launch. I was going to make a, a pie chart, but uh, it got too complicated, so I was just using colors. Uh, basically, the green bits are, the, the, green bits are the, the creative bits. The white bits are really nothing to do with having ideas or, or writing code. And I recognize that now there are some solutions for these boring bits. No one really buys servers anymore. And services like Heroku, uh, that Mark mentioned just now, or, or, and particularly for, for Django developers, uh, Divio, do a great job of removing lots of the server bits. But I've noticed that as coders, we never really like to make things easy for ourselves. And, uh, and as soon as we, we remove some tasks, we like to add new ones. So um, now, of course, it's important that you set up your continuous integration and your continuous deployment. And, uh, and you probably use configuration management like uh, Salt Stack or Ansible. And then you've got your, uh, your five layers of uh, front-end tooling to transpile and compress and minify and version and beautify and uglify. And I do appreciate the benefits of all these innovations, but I'm also worried that the gap between idea and launch is still too large. So I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting there. This, this brings me to the subject of this talk. First, I have to, uh, I have to address this term. This is a word that, that can really wind people up. And I know that there are at least four of you in this audience who are now thinking about the angry tweets you're going to write uh, about, about this word. Um, and of course, those four of you are right. It is a, it is a misnomer. Uh, there are still massive data centers full of hot, noisy, power-hungry servers running operating systems that have hypervisors and containers on top, and then proxies and hardware routers and firewalls and so on. So even though, from the point of view of the developer, there is no server that we need to think about, we should probably pick another term. Uh, as far as I know, it was Martin Fowler who first came up with functions as a service as a, as a more meaningful name for this, this, this whole concept. That's a bit of a mouthful, so it usually gets shortened to FAS. Uh, incidentally, if I were ever to write my own serverless platform, I would definitely call it Fassbender, uh, um, in a sort of tribute to the, the, the beautiful and charismatic German-Irish actor. Um, so that one's, that one's mine. Um, now I'm finally getting into the details. So, uh, have any of you here used a serverless platform? Hands up. Wow. Uh, it looks like three, four, five. Not many. OK, so, uh, so this is the back to basics bit. This, this, this is how they work. You, uh, you define your function just in the way that you are used to. You, your, your programs are broken down into functions. So you have your lovely function, take some input. You do something clever with it, and you return the output. You're all familiar with that. Um, and then the next step is that all on these platforms, they'll have some command line deploy tool. Uh, in, in Chalice, the one I'm going to show you later, it's the word deploy. And uh, you reference your app. And then uh, it thinks for a couple of seconds. The first time you do it, it might take 20 seconds. Uh, subsequently, when you do updates, it typically takes two seconds. And then it will return uh, a, a URL that's unique, that a URL from your uh, functions as a service, service that's unique to you and uh, that remains your URL from now on. And then you can, you can call it, and it will return the answer, which is 42. The first time I tried this, I felt pretty excited. I, I love seeing this movement, and it seems like a this is a sort of inevitable move always in, in computing towards abstraction. You have to abstract everything. And so probably, maybe some of you in your kind of career as developers have kind of been kind of halfway down this. But uh, you know, for someone who used to have to go into data centers, uh, you know, these kind of horrible, noisy places, which are you know, air conditioned up to the max, and you've got to plug in wires and stuff, and, you know, getting to this stage at the end where you're just writing Python and pressing a button and having it live is, feels really magical. Uh, some of you who uh, may also notice that some of this is a bit similar to how CGI worked. 
a long time ago, but uh, that slightly spoils my flow, so I'm going to skip that point. So now the, be the benefits. So the benefits, the, the one I've, I've talked about mainly so far, is about reducing this gap between idea and launch. But here are some of the other ways that functions in a service may help you. First is scaling. Once you've written your function, you now have thousands of them at your disposal. You're in charge of an infinite number of willing robots, all sleeping in their little robot beds, ready to be woken up and set a task with a few milliseconds notice. So it makes you feel pretty good. And then a second point, which is related but, but different, is parallelization, which is a difficult word to say uh, any time, let alone to 350 people. Uh, that's, and that's a different aspect of this, because as well as starting up robots when things get busy on your site, you can also command hundreds of them to perform the same action at once. Say you have 20,000 images in your, in, your, in your web app that have all been uploaded by your users, and then you realize that actually you're exposing some of their private data on them because they, you, you haven't stripped out the EXIF data, so someone could, could maliciously look at those images and work out the geographical positioning and other stuff. So quickly, you need to find a way of stripping that EXIF data from your images. So the, 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 kind of the, the way that, that we're all familiar with is you, you write a Python script. You use the, one of the EXIF libraries, and you, you fire it at your S3 bucket, and you iterate over each one. So it takes two seconds each. That works out at 11 hours for 20,000 images. Otherwise, you could fire up 1,000 functions, and you could tell them all to work on two images each. You'll need to write a bit more code in this scenario, because now each function needs to know which images it's got to handle. But it's OK to spend a few hours or, you know, half an hour writing that cleverer code, because now the whole thing's going to run in 40 seconds. Scaling down is also important. One of the reasons that I didn't keep those old sites going is that some of them weren't getting used for days at a time. This is uh, an expression that I, um, I realize now that I've uh, taken from Chris Adams' talk tomorrow. Um, those of you who are parents will be uh, familiar with, with this sentence. and um, Maybe it translates as well across cultures. I find myself saying this quite a lot at home. From an, from an ecological point of view, as well as just the financial efficiency, it makes no sense to run your servers when no one is using them. And that's, that's the promise of, of functions of, of a service. You only pay for the commute time. Another feature of almost all the serverless platforms is that they respond to more varied events than you're used to handling. So as well as the HTTP endpoint, you can also trigger a function when someone uploads an S3 file. In, 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 in Mark's uh, example of how this might work in his new model, uh, when someone uploads a, an, an MP3 to the S3 file, you can trigger a function and once that upload has, com has completed and then you know, pull some metadata or create the record. Uh, you can also communicate with your functions through pub-sub channels or accept incoming emails. So that, that project I talked about right at the beginning about Mailbucket, that would have been a perfect candidate here. Instead of having to write this complicated XM handle, I could just let Google SES take the incoming emails and, uh, and just push each one to a function. And finally, a, fi a final advantage I want to talk about is how I think serverless platforms encourage better design. There are two principles, uh, a few principles, but two of the principles that I try to espouse at Torchbox. Are, uh, are these. And the first one is an old Unix philosophy. And this is in line, I think, with, with, with the ideas that Andrew was talking about this morning. So this idea that you, know, you should try to, generally, problems are easier to solve when you break them into smaller parts. And, uh, and that moving to a services-based model is a good fit for a lot of applications. And uh, having, having functions as a service encourages you to work that way. I also really like this idea of writing less code. Um, uh, there's a great article about this by uh, Jeff Atwood. Um, and a few people, a few people have, have talked about this. I, I like it. It's really counterintuitive. You can imagine what our ancestors would have thought uh, of you know, us coming home at the end of the day and saying, honey, today I deleted 200 lines of code. Um, but generally, you know, less code is better. And uh, one thing that you get with, with, with the serverless frameworks is you, you get to remove a lot of boilerplate. You don't need to do a lot of the stuff that's around it. So you can reduce your code in total. These are some of the, the main toolkits that, that are available to you at the moment. Uh, the, the, the granddaddy is, the, is Lambda, the, the Amazon service. And uh, like, like with most of the Amazon cloud products, it's, it's really powerful, but it's also horrible to use. It's, it's really complicated. For example, you need to 
create your function, you also have to create your API endpoint, and then you have to handle the permissions between the API endpoint and the function. Um, Google Cloud Functions is, is a bit newer. They are only supporting JavaScript at the moment, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they add Python to that soon. Microsoft's alternative looks pretty good. They do Python and JavaScript and C Sharp and PHP. Um, and then this, the, the bottom half are frameworks that sit on top of those. And perhaps the most interesting one for the long term is Serverless, which I think is a funded organization. Um, and uh, it, it wraps a lot of the features nicely, but also it abstracts them so it, uh, it removes any concerns you might have about portability, because I think at the moment it, it runs mainly on, on, on Lambda, but it, it's, uh, they're writing plugins so that you can, your serverless functions could be run on the Google Cloud or the Azure Cloud, or there's a, IBM have a thing, OpenWhisk, Open that's it, um, which is a, an open source alternative. And then Chalice and Zapper are, are, are simpler, simpler wrappers. Um, Chalice is the one that I've used most. I like it because it's, uh, it's, it's got the least magic that I can see. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, the, it's the one I'll use for the demo now. And then Zapper has got a great name, and it's just really, really funky stuff. Um, but I, I, my recommendation would be start with Chalice and then understand the things that Zapper gives you too. And finally, I want to mention uh, this, this tool's now, which is a terrible name to Google, uh, from Zite.co. And I mentioned this, it's a, it's a JavaScript only, well, it's JavaScript and Docker, but it's focused on JavaScript, so it's not quite so relevant for this talk, but it is, uh, it's very, very thoughtful. It's like Heroku for hipsters, and uh, um, maybe you thought Heroku was for hipsters, but uh, the real hipsters have moved on from Heroku, and they're, on, they're, on, they're now on now. Um, and, uh, but it's worth checking out, because it's, it's got a beautiful command line interface, and it does a lot of things really thoughtfully, so uh, basically, you, you, you write your function, you type now, and one of the things they optimize is how quickly you get the URL that you can then you can then share, and it's, it's really quick. And that's partly because they give you the URL before it starts working. But nevertheless, there's a lot of uh, UI niceties on that. Here are some use cases. The, the hello world of, of serverless is uh, thumbnailing. So um, pretty much the first example that you're going to see and the first one you might try is doing a thumbnail. And this is a, it's actually a pretty good use case. It's one that, uh, that maybe, if you're doing lots of thumbnailing on your site at the moment, it's probably one of the most CPU-intensive bits. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing to to push out to a, to a function. And similarly, document processing is a kind of similar problem, because uh, maybe you've got some, some complex, uh, I was talking to some people here uh, at lunchtime who, uh, who work at a publishers, and you know, they manage the workflow between InDesign, XML, EPUB. You know, th those kind of document processing things can also be expensive and outside the, uh, the main remit of your web service. And then another thing that might be worth pushing out. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk a bit about static sites later, but APIs is, uh, that, that's, APIs is a bit similar to the kind of examples I was showing before. So when you've got a site that doesn't have an API, you can, uh, it's, it's quick to build one on the top. Here's an example. So someone has curated this list of uh, open source content management systems. There's about 103 at the moment, I think. And uh, I, um, in my role as a kind of you know, worrying about Wagtail, I, I, I used to look at this. But annoyingly, they're, they're broken down into technologies. And really, I want to know where Wagtail sits overall. So. Um, I, uh, I wrote a function in, uh, on Chalice uh, It does some beautiful soup stuff. And uh, I always, when I look at m beautiful soup code that I've written, it always makes me think of that Pearl joke about write once, write once, read never. Because uh, I can never understand what it was, and I didn't bother commenting it. I don't know why that works. But it does, and it spits out a, um, uh, a load of JSON, uh, which I then consume in a 10-line in a Vue.js app. And uh, you can see here that uh, out of the 103, Wagtail is currently number nine. Um, uh, it's always just a little bit behind Magento, and I think if half of you in the room were to, uh, to star it, you know, in the next half hour, I think that would be, um, uh, that'd be a kind of important step forward for the Django community. Um, so uh, feel, feel duty bound. Um, here's an app with, uh, with a bit more local appeal. So um, uh, our, our, our wonderful hosts have created this beautiful site with a lovely kind of film strip theming. Um, and it's, it's got everything there, and it, it loads fast, but it's quite tr tricky to see everything in one go, because it's a long page. So, um, so we, can, we can write a quick uh, function as a service, which, which converts this into an API. So here's how you start. You pip install Chalice, if we're using Chalice, and then a bit like the Django admin, you can start a new project uh, with a term new project, and you, you give your new project a name, and that will create a directory with a few, um, with a kind of a stubbed out app for you. And then in your app, those of you who have ever used Flask will notice this is familiar. So there's a decorator that maps the URL to the function. In the function, you do the 
scrapey bit, and then you return, uh, you return a, a, a struct, a JSON struct. And actually, there's, there's an interesting point about Chalice. That Chalice doesn't let you return HTML, which at first feels a little bit like a, a bit of a limitation. But uh, actually, I think it's a good thing because it's a, it's, a, it's a good discipline to get you thinking about using apps, using your functions as services rather than as kind of little simple websites. And also, almost all of them give you this little, this kind of convenient helper function that runs, uh, runs an equivalent version locally for, for quicker debugging. Uh, so you can see it running on localhost, and then you hit deploy, and then you, you wait a few seconds, and it returns with, the, uh, with this URL. And so this is returning the JSON feed. Um, and here is uh, uh, here's, here's the, uh, a reduced page using, uh, using the API to give you kind of an overview of the schedule. Again, it's a, it's a very short Vue.js app. Um, you can also, uh, yeah, that's the URL if you want to try it locally. You can also, while you're doing that, you could admire what an early adopter I am that I got the Tom bucket on S3. Um, but uh, but single, page, single page websites have had their day, really. They're old school. The new thing is bots. We, everyone's got to have a bot, uh, maybe several bots. And um, so we've already built our API, and we might as well communicate with that API through a bot. So um, now, if you, uh, if you have any Wi-Fi or you're tethering to your phone, you could type slash schedule into, your, uh, into Slack. And uh, that will wait a second while it talks to the function as a service, which scrapes the data off uh, the, the website. And then it will return with a list of the schedule uh, on your Slack app. Is that working for anybody? Yes? No? Yeah? I'm sure it is working for all of you. Uh, by default, it defaults to the day you're on, or you can, you can send it an argument, and that will give it the, the, the schedule for tomorrow. Yeah? Great. <laughs> um, the, the, I think some of the really shonky code for this is, is here, as well as some of the links that I've talked about. So now I'm really, you know, I, I've kind of been keeping you in suspense all this time about uh, how this is actually going to work for your, for your Django apps. This is a Django conference. We're here to think about how, how, to, how, to, how to use serverless in a Django context. And one initial response might be, let's just make our Django app serverless. Let's just, uh, you know, let's, let, let's just make them a service. And then we'll fire them up when, when they, they get requested. And in fact, there are ways of doing that. And that, this is one of the tricks I, I mentioned that Zappa has some funky tricks. And this is one of the tricks that Zappa does. So it will take your Uwhiskey app and it will work out uh, your Whiskey app, not your Uwhiskey app. And it will, it, will, it, will, it will work out how it all fits together. And then it will do things like, generally, one of the problems is that there's a, there's a maximum file size for the function. So it will zip it up. It will upload it to S3. And then when you request it, uh, the server will download it from S3 and unzip it and run it. And you know, there's a lot of clever magic that makes that possible. But I don't think it's the way to go. I don't think, uh, I don't think this, is what, this, is, this is the best use of serverless, even though you know, I'm a lot of respect to the Zappa people for making it possible. I think you're much better off using your functions as a service alongside your Django apps. And the first thing you can do is shrink your Django apps. So Django is fantastic for you know, CRUD-based stuff, publishing, publishing, uh, managing content in one place, publishing it in lots of different ways. It's really highly optimized for that. All the caching and routing layers is wonderful. And uh, you know, actually, you can, you can run some pretty big sites off a $10 DigitalOcean box if you need to, if, you, if you're using Django for what it's good at. But if your bits of your app are, are going beyond that, then this is a way of of, of shrinking them and, and, and pushing them out to functions. You can also use functions as a service to, to flatten the bumps. So in a bit, a bit like that dynamic demand example, if you're getting peaks in different areas, you know, perhaps at different times a day, you could push those off to functions as a service to keep your, your core functionality stable. And then following on from Andrew's talk this morning, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're signed up to the, uh, the, the microservices revolution, then functions as a service are a, a way of helping you get there. I, I recommend moving cautiously because of all the the friction, the difficulties that Andrew talked about. So you could, you might, if, you, if, you, if you're doing CMS, you might consider the Jamstack. Has, has anyone heard of Jamstack? This was an acronym that, as far as I can gather, was, was coined about two months ago, and there's already a, a conference for it in, South Af in, the, in uh, San Francisco. It stands for JavaScript, which means JavaScript on the browser, APIs, and markup delivered statically. Um, and, uh, and the idea is that, uh, you, you know, you'd, you, Static sites are um, fantastic for lots of reasons. Wagtail was used by uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign to, to run HillaryClinton.com. And I, um, in the early days, I was talking to the guy who's in charge of uh, the infrastructure there. 
and he, he was cer dead certain from the beginning that he wanted all their static content to run off S3 behind CloudFront and everything else. Because even though it meant that there was a, might be a two-minute delay between the editors hitting publish and that, that content going live, it meant that there was never going to be a headline about Hillary's web server as well as her email server. Um, but when you move to a static site, you get all the benefits of performance and security and low cost, but you might lose some stuff. You might lose personalization or even comments. Or, and that's where, where this Jamstack bit comes in, where you have static sites, but uh, the interactive bits you do around the edges using APIs that you typically communicate with JavaScript. And I think serverless functions are a good way of kind of handling that, those outside bits. And lastly, this point I made earlier about how you can use you can use the ability of uh, these serverless platforms to handle other events. So if you want your, your app to, to do something when, you, when it receives an email or uh, uh, someone uploads an S3 file or something, then that it makes it much easier. So it's not all roses. There are some caveats. Uh, there's a bit of warm-up time. So you, know, you have to start the, uh, you have to s these functions have to start up. And uh, interestingly, the Python seems to be the best at this. So the, the Python startup times across the platforms tend to be the, the quickest. Um, uh, the, the, the platforms are still maturing, so um, in particular, the, the worst issue is that uh, on Lambda, which most of the services are running on, it's Python 2.7 only, which seems crazy, um, but, and I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that they'll move to Python 3, but uh, that, that's a good indicator of, a good example of the lack of maturity. One slightly interesting point is that there's no cost cap with functions as a service, and this, I guess, is one of the reassuring things about the the um, you know your own server model is is if if Mailbucket suddenly kind of accidentally became Facebook, then uh, my server would just fall over and I wouldn't have to uh, I wouldn't have to pay anything. But uh, if you're running on functions service and it and it uh, and you and you hit front page of Hacker News and it, and it goes crazy, then obviously you're you're going to be liable for all those tiny little robots doing your work. And finally, the big one really is persistence. So um, there is no clear answer for how you handle persistence with, with functions as a service. Um, uh, and many of, our, many of our sites require that. And uh, this is another example why I think Django isn't a, good, isn't a good app to make serverless itself, because it needs a database, typically. It needs some kind of relational database. And there are some, I think there'll be, there'll be some, some work around this. The best case I think of at the moment is the, actually the Amazon SimpleDB service, which is a very simple NoSQL database. And it does work on a kind of serverless model where you're only paying for uh, for kind of compute time and a little bit of storage. But the other ones, even DynamoDB, which is more powerful, uh, you have to kind of pay up front a bit. So at the moment, that, that's, that's a bit of an unsolved problem. And it probably means that uh, the kind of functions that you're going to make serverless sh shouldn't be ones that are rely on being backed by a big relational database. But having said that, uh, I am confident that these issues will all be solved as the, as the platforms mature. And I'm going to leave you with this inspiring quote from Timothy Prickett Morgan, and uh, where he says, this is perhaps the final state of computing as we know it, which is a pretty grandiose statement. Uh, indeed, it is hard to imagine where we go from here. Perhaps deployed functions will start being expressed within the programming language itself. In the meantime, I wonder if there are changes that could be made within Wagtail in Django that, uh, that would make it more function as, as a service friendly. For example, you might have a, a FAS decorator, which would be the equivalent of the cache decorator, uh, which automatically makes your view function available as a service. Perhaps one of you will build that and present it at next year's DjangoCon. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking. I think we only have time for one question. So please, Mark. And <laughs> Later, I mean, uh, Tom will be here for the next two days, and there is Slack, so. Yeah. I think this is a very quick question, so uh, hopefully very easily answered. And sorry if you already covered it. I really enjoyed that, by the way. Thank you. Um, are there any provisions for, uh, for Python for requirements.txt or um, managing dependencies for those uh, functions? So if your function, rep you know, I'm thinking of managing metadata for MP3, so can I say that my function in, in um, Chalice requires mutagen and get that installed as well. Does that yeah. work? Yeah, that works. That works for pure Python uh, modules. And so, for example, in the, uh, the one I showed, I needed to import beautiful soup. It works the same. You, have, uh, you put it in your requirements.txt, and, and, it, and it runs at the required time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, quick question, and yeah. uh, I ask you to yeah. give a quick answer. 
Yeah, really quick one. I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Thank um, you. Do you have any experiences like in how can we orchestrate something like that? You mentioned PubSub. Any other toolkits, frameworks? Yeah, um, I, I mean, you could do orchestration, uh, if this is what you mean, you mean you could use Ansible to configure your, uh, your, your functions as a service. And Maybe like a pipeline where you like call first this function as a service and then this one. Yeah, so there is a new thing called function service pipelines okay. in AWS which handles that, but there aren't wrappers for it yet as far as I know. Okay. Let's talk later. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much.